Welcome to From Moment to Movement. I'm your host, Tamara Banks. The U.S. is at a critical point in its history. Millions of Americans are rallying, demonstrating, protesting, protesting, and some, yes, are even rioting to make their voices heard, particularly Black Americans. Racism is steeped into the very core of this country. And now in 2020, Black voices are tired of being ignored, muffled, and killed. We're experiencing an important moment. African Americans need this moment to march, protest, cry, and pray, and to be heard, to evoke change. From moment to movement hopes to provide a platform for black voices. A movement has to arise from the ashes of a moment. From moment to movement is a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with members of our black community aimed at giving a platform to hear their experiences and work towards changing our systems. Our guest today is Makisha Boot, founder of Sister Biz, an organization that provides support for black women entrepreneurs. Makisha, thank you so much for joining us. So great to see you again. You too. Thanks for having me, Tamara. You bet. So listen, we've been um, experiencing the news in which more and more information comes out about the three most recent police killings, uh, Ahmad, Aubrey, and Brunswick, Georgia, George Floyd in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, and Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, and so many more that we can't even name that that would take the entire program. And so now we're speaking and seeing more uh, protests, demonstrations, and rallies, and like I said, even riots. It feels like this is an important moment. How are you feeling about this moment, this, this moment in time? How are you feeling? Wow, that's a big question because I'm feeling so many different ways about, about this moment in time. And there are so many layers to my emotions and to what, how I'm processing this and the perspectives that I bring as a mom, as a business owner, as a black woman, as a mother of a black son um, who is 19 and, and African-American nephews and nieces that are out and about living their life. And it could be them in any moment um, experiencing, but for the grace of God. And so for me, there's a lot of layers. There's a lot of emotion. Um, there is a difference in the response um, right now um, to the riots on the part of people that are non-Black that is surprising for me. And that's a lot to process as well. I haven't seen that in my lifetime. I'm not saying it hasn't happened before, but um, there's that. There's the magnitude of the reach of the, of, of, of the movement this time. It's in countries everywhere. And um, and the internet really helps to magnify the reach as well. And so there's just a, a new level to what's happening because it's not a new issue. It's not a new response. Um, and, and it's just the magnitude and um, the level at which is happening right now that really has me still processing and trying to figure out how to manage and deal and contribute to the movement. Yeah, I think you are absolutely right. There is something different about... Um this moment in time and the allies that we're seeing are folks you wouldn't no normally see. They're not the usual suspects. You expect to see white liberals and young people and, and even people who helped, um, white allies who helped push forward the civil rights movement and then the civil rights act. But, but for whatever reason, the tipping point is finally here and seeing people um, step up and come, come forward. And I often wonder when that movement sort of started, if this is, a moment and the, the the movement is is uh is just you know it we're in it right now like when did it all begin um what are your thoughts on that like was it just when we started when we saw these latest high profile um police killings or or was there something else uh, an undercurrent going on that maybe we didn't recognize what are your thoughts um i think it started the first time anybody in the african diaspora decided to fight back so hundreds of years ago. And I think, and I say that really deeply because I was talking to a friend who is not black the other day and I was telling her, you know, it, it, 
I get that you are intensely impacted by what you saw in that video and, and what's happening around the world and you're emotional and you want to do something about it. Um, but I want you to take that level of energy that you're feeling right now and imagine that we're feeling as black people, we're feeling that energy and we're feeling that energy processing what we see because it is us. So we see ourselves in that man. We see our sons in that man. Then we are processing this for the entire diaspora because there's a collective heavy weight feeling around what's happening right now in the racial trauma of today, of the current experience right now we're experiencing. And then there's the the PTSD, the, the generational weight that we're carrying. So I'm not just feeling what I'm feeling for George. I'm feeling it for George, for my son for my family, for my grandmother, for my great-grandmother, for the generations ahead of her. And so there's layers of pain that are coming um, to play in what, what I'm experiencing right now as I process what's happening. And so I think it started hundreds of years ago, and that's the issue. The issue is that it's not just today. And when people ask you how you feel about seeing an email pop into your, or a chain of emails pop into your email box where white organizations are saying, we stand for this and this is wrong, you feel some type of way because you've been saying that for your entire life and generations prior to you, they've been saying it. And many people died just to get to that email of acknowledgement. We won't even talk about action. Well, you raise an interesting point um, that it's almost like, and I'm not a therapist, I don't play one on TV, but I think about as a reporter when I knock on someone's door and I say, I'm so sorry for your loss. Can you tell me about your child that was killed in Columbine or the Aurora movie theater or in, when I'm covering the genocide in, um, in, in Sudan? And when the person tells their story, they're, they're being re-traumatized. And while I think it's... Um, it's good and we need to bring this out. It's, it, there has to be, I'm thinking maybe a mechanism and a space for people to be able to have this conversation and feel like, okay, I'm really living through this every day. Now I've got to explain this to you. And that in and of itself can be traumatizing. Do you, am I on point with that you think? On point, and I'm going to take it a step further. I feel like imagine that that person that knocked on your door and asked you how your son was doing, their parents or they were the ones who killed them. So the oppressor is even asking. Um, and so it's, it's, a, the, it's important to understand that relationship there when you are asking me to explain to you something that your people have done to my people. Then that relationship dynamic yeah. is, and then if you look at the relationship dynamics that are happening, depending on who's asking who in the current environment today, maybe it's the boss asking a call, someone in the work environment. So you don't feel safe talking about that stuff in an authentic and vulnerable way in the work environment where there are power dynamics and where you've had to code switch and where you have had to manage gaslighting and manage racism in that environment just to make it. And then you come to me at this in this situation where there's so much pain and you want me to then engage with you um, on the topic. It's 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 you gotta be sensitive, you gotta be um, thoughtful if you're truly interested in being an, an ally in how you you ask and who you ask and when you ask and make sure that you're not just kind of throwing it out there and having expectations that someone wants to um, engage in that type of conversation. Not everybody's ready. Some people are, and that's good, but everybody has to decide in this moment what they need to heal, to restore, to participate. And, and I think that's uh, um, what happens when you're in that white privilege space. You feel like you can just ask somebody right now boldly, like, well, what's happening? And, and tell me how you feel and uh, explain this to me. It's almost like, let me touch your hair, you know, if right. someone's wearing their hair. Like, I didn't give you permission to do that. So it's almost like we should probably have some sort of um, tips for people who want to engage and really intentionally have the intentions of doing something good to kind of guide them through how to be most helpful. Yeah, and I think that we are trying to figure as a people and I, I'm i speaking largely for myself, my friends, my immediate family, the network that I lead, we are trying to figure out how to get ourselves through this situation. We're trying to heal, we're mourning, we're hurting. Um, we don't have time to take care of other people when we're trying to figure out how to just get ourselves through these moments. And so 
Um, no, I can't speak on your panel and I can't dialogue about this right now. That might be my answer. Or I might not respond at all. And you need to be okay with that because everybody has to find their way and take care of themselves and get themselves and their families through this time. And, and please don't tell me all lives matter because clearly if all lives had mattered, we wouldn't have to have this conversation of black lives matter. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about, um, the conversation that we have with our, our young folks. I don't have kids, but I've got now step kids. I call them bonus kids. And I've got younger uh, nieces, nephews, and, and cousins about how you conduct yourself um, when you're out in places it, it, where you might run into the police. Um, and then now it's even kind of doubled up and the, the volume is turned up and how we um, train our young people to, to behave almost like apologetic for who they are and, and how they look. How do you have that conversation with your son? Well, I've been having these conversations with my son way too early for him to have, should have, for, you know, his age was very early and he shouldn't have to have those conversations. Nobody should have to have those conversations with their child so young. But I wanted to protect my son, just like my mother and father wanted to protect me and going down the generations, like starting with slavery. Parents have had to not just raise kids, but they've had to raise kids and shield them from death and murder and, um, and racism and so and survival of racism. And so the reality is that I had to have conversations with him very early on. Um, and, and he's in a, you know, mostly white environment growing up here where I'm at in Denver. And so, well, as I grew up in Harlem, where I rarely saw people that weren't black. And so um, it was a dynamic for me to learn how to like sh show him how to um, carry himself for his own safety. Um, the things that I did with my son were I really tried to empower him to understand how strong he is, how great he is, how powerful he is, and how everybody doesn't agree with that. And that mm -hmm. it, the, the devil's a lie. So I really want you to understand that there are lies out there about you. There are myths out there about you. And here's who you are, young prince. And, and show him through education. So he was reading the new Jim Crow in ju junior high school. Mm. He read um, the, the people's history of United States in sixth grade. His school, his white school called me and said that he very laid out a very graphic detailed version of um, Columbus, um, you know, raping land and, 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 and massacring people on Columbus Day. When they were trying to celebrate Columbus Day, he let them know what the holiday really was. So I've always yeah. been really honest with my son and really showed him because I had to, because I wanted him to be able to deconstruct um, all of the lies and the myths that would would hurt him. Um, I lead in the Sister Biz Network, I lead every month a Black Girl Therapy session. Yesterday was Black Girl Therapy session, and we had Dr. Candace Nicole, who is the director of um, Healing Racial Trauma, the, the Center for Healing Raci Racial Trauma in the University of Kentucky. And um, she's just one, she's a guest who talked with us about racial battle fatigue and racial trauma yesterday. And every month we have a therapist or a mental health professional or, or researcher come in and talk to us about these words and these things that um, we are experiencing um, in racism and discrimination, like code switching, gaslighting, invisible labor, um, white tears and white fragility. Um, all those things are actual terms and concepts. And I like to put it, I found that my strength has lied in knowing my history educating myself and knowing exactly what the true story is and what really happened to my people and the intentional genocide and um and um and project around you know breaking down an entire people the new jim crow um the old jim crow you know wow. and understanding the concepts and the names and the things that are happening to me even in this day and age as a result they still have carried on in the workplace in interracial relationships our entire system is built around whiteness and anything that is not of whiteness is 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 viewed as wrong is yeah. is not is not validated and so understanding that and knowing the concepts and the terms as they have happened to me in situations has empowered me. So that's what I do with my son. I make sure he understands, he reads, he really understands the history and how whiteness and blackness even came to be because that's a man constructed thing. And so um, 
And so it's really about educating him and helping him understand so that he can defend himself with knowledge as well as, you know, all the other things we have to put into place for their safety. That's a really good point. We're often so quick to say the white community needs to educate themselves and uh, we ourselves are so ill-informed. It's, uh, it's, it can be very sad. The, you know, the whole purpose of this show is to um, provide a platform for, so voices can be heard. Um, and so I want to ask you, Makisha, as we wrap up, what do, does the white mainstream America need to hear that they haven't heard yet? I don't know if they haven't heard it yet, but I know that I want to repeat it if they have heard it and reinforce it. And that's that, you know, um, before this became the sexy news cycle of the day right now, a lot of us were on the front line fighting to say what's being now okay to say. It's, it's okay to say these things now, but they haven't always been okay to say. As early as a month or two ago, it wasn't okay to do certain things or say certain things that everyone is seeing as now um, the movement. And um, and I and so two things I want to kind of say in relation to that. The first is that a lot of us have been on the front lines. Many of our ancestors have died just so you could get to the place where you acknowledge the injustices that you're now currently acknowledging. And so just know that there's 400 years of a fight to just get us to this day. And we're dealing with and managing that. And if you're going to join in, what I want to say is be in it to win it all the way for long-term meaningful transformation, action-based work around this work both internally working on your own soul and spirit and mindset and, 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 um, and educating yourself and then institutionally and systemically making changes that, you know, will change the way that um, we've been treated um, and change the, the things that ha have happened in this country so that our children don't have to experience this. And so I guess what I'm saying is um, I want to see what this looks like past the news cycles that are coming in these next few months. I want to see this work continue on um, and turn into change policy, um, changes in resource allocation, changes in laws, um, changes in the way that we, um, you know, build culture, organizational culture. Um, what's right is not, you know, white is no longer right, but I want to see cultural changes. And so if you're down for this and the cultural changes, then I feel like, um, I feel like then, you know, I really feel like that's the real work right there. Good advice. Thank you, Makisha Booth, the founder of Sister Biz. Great to see you. I appreciate your time. You, you be safe and, uh, and careful out there. Stay healthy. You all too. right, Makisha. Thank you. Right. And thank you all for watching us. We appreciate your time as well. Thank you for joining us from Moment to Movement. You can find out more information about this program at pbs12.org. I'm Tamara Banks. We'll see you next time.